where did you find like okay maybe this step was a good step that proves to to myself that i have done something which i'm happy with always like continuing like even when you don't want to i think that probably the best thing it's not like one thing but it's just like pushing yourself to keep going even after you're disappointed so many times did you find love yeah i always like to reframe my state of mind to like mm. you build love you know because i used to look to find love and it's the truth is it's not found it's built so is hassan with you in dubai bling yeah yes <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i can hear my thoughts <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have it that's why we have this microphone oh. so we can hear your thoughts oh no that's creepy yeah <laughs> so tell me about your thoughts my thoughts right now what do you dream of oh my gosh are we starting yes we rolled ah, <laughs> not ready <laughs> um my dreams um honestly I, I think i'm a big dreamer i have so many dreams um part of it is what i'm doing already like i feel like it's it's starting to finally actualize after you know, working on them for so many years now, you know, but I really just want to see things come to light. Like I'm a very creative person. I like taking an idea from the idea phase to making it something reality. So I feel like I'm starting to see my dreams come true, but I'm at the very beginning. I have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you plan on creating a dream or creating a product usually is it something that you look at as in terms of you know is is a business uh, aspect always to it or is something that you love is something mm -hmm. that satisfies you as, as a as a person how do you come up with ideas so my ideas they they're always coming from different places you know sometimes i'm just inspired by someone something a memory an emotion um, sometimes, a lot of times it's my team. My team comes up with the best ideas as well. So it's always like a different mixture of, of things, um, but it always starts with a feeling, you know, I'm mm -hmm. a very emotional person. You are. Yeah. Yeah. You think we, we should always like find anything that we work with that we love, we should love, we should connect with emotionally and, mm. and come, come up with any idea that's really talks about us or about our feelings. Yeah, absolutely. I think the best ideas come from a lot of sincere emotion and especially something that if you want to create something meaningful, authentic, it's got to come from the heart. And um, and yeah, I feel like it needs to come with a lot of emotion. Otherwise, it's just going to be an average or even below average idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say you're emotional, tell me, tell me more about that. Well, I also think everybody's emotional. I think that we're all emotional, sensitive beings. I think a lot of people suppress their emotions. Um, so I feel like I'm in touch with my emotions. I feel things deeply. Um, I think everybody should. I think a lot of people don't because they put up walls or they just block certain areas of themselves. Um, but yeah, I think I'm in touch with my emotions and I, I love to love. I love to give happy emotions, happy feelings. So yeah, I think um, in that respect, I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. You think, yeah. Mona, um, we, ha we have a lot of people who doesn't really express their emotions and they keep them, you know, hidden inside. And mm -hmm. we have like a lack of expressing ourselves or tell tell other people what, what we feel, what what are the things that makes us happy or sad or how we express yeah. ourselves. Where do, where do you think this is coming from? Why do we have, where I see it, a lack of, you know, expressing ourselves? I think it comes from just being taught not to do that, you know, whether it's like you get hurt from expressing your emotions or your parents teach you not to express your emotions, your teachers, like just it comes from childhood. And I think that with age, you start to do it less and less. And before you know it, you don't even have a connection with yourself anymore, you know, because I do believe your emotions are kind of like a guide to to help you find the right decisions it's a you know it's the connection to your intuition it's the connection to your subconscious so i feel like it's so important to have that open dialogue with yourself but i think that um we're taught not to mm -hmm. you know and usually it's it's from being hurt and also your family your adults in your life teach you not to feel certain ways they tell you what you're feeling is wrong at least that was in our time you know mm -hmm. maybe things have changed now thank god but you know when i was growing up that was kind of the world we grew up in where people told you not to feel a certain way and they kind of made you feel bad for certain things so i think i think we are definitely seeing a change in that but i think it needs to change more and i think people need to unlearn 
that they should kind of hold themselves back. You know, it's like, don't not feel a certain way, just process how you feel. So you understand why, you, why you're feeling a certain way. Mm. You know? Yeah, you're right. We, I mean, we kind of sometimes lose the campus like, okay, um, this is how I feel and this is what mm. I want. And it's, it's be because probably we've not been asked that much of our opinion when we were mm -hmm. young. And it's always like we relate what we like with other people. Maybe, okay, they like it or they, other people, you know, opinion. Yeah. And that's the, that's the bad thing. I mean, it should be your opinion. It should be your own um you know your own uh, thoughts your own yeah. feelings and but we we lose it sometimes and comes do you think we can recover that on my experience i think so i think that if you teach yourself how to process your feelings and even go through your you know um your memories and try to process old feelings old memories old emotions that you didn't deal with properly and that's something you do a lot in therapy i don't know do you do therapy no i think i need you don't do therapy <laughs> no what <laughs> okay we're I talking need. after this yeah exactly no, i think everybody needs to mm. do therapy the same way everybody needs to work out for their health it's like another part of your health right it's like i really believe there's four four different layers of health there's like emotional emotional mental physical spiritual health you know so you have to exercise each one and yes you can exercise them on your own but of course it's always better to have a trainer so i think that you know a therapist is your trainer for your mental health and your emotional health so i definitely believe in therapy but yeah going back to processing your feelings even if you didn't do it in the past it's never too late and that's something they they do with you in therapy like one of the first stages mm -hmm. is kind of like walking yourself through different points in your life that maybe you haven't dealt with yet and processing them to understand your triggers to understand why you feel very emotional about certain things and it's a great way to just understand yourself yeah sometimes Mona it's hard for some people also me I mean the way I grow is like we have we haven't like uh, tap on that uh, subject and it was a taboo in a way in some yeah. in some countries some areas and and also maybe with men they try to hide their feelings and yeah. their emotions and to go to a therapist you need to reach to a point where you start to feel the pain or start to feel you yeah. know uh, at, at the moment we are at a stage where oh I need to but maybe you have to before and yeah. it, it wasn't it, it's not an easy topic that's like waiting to get diabetes and like be super obese before you start training you know what i mean mm. it's like no if you want to be in the best state of mind and the best state emotionally start training before you get there you know mm -hmm. what i mean yeah uh, I, li I like how you put it like training yeah. so it's like like going to the gym i mean yeah. it's training your soul training your emotions your, emotions, mm. your mind your mental health everything so i think it's so critical and if anything i think your mental health your emotional health and even your spiritual health is much more important than your physical health because that's usually going to be affected by all three so if you take care of everything else your physical health will be okay even if you don't work out but if you don't take care of all those and you go to the gym every day trust me you're not going to be in a good state you know mm. and we feel always we're trying to recover from our childhood memories and always mm. to think of okay how we can improve or it's and I had a, I had a, a debate with one before one of my podcasts about are we recovering are we you know uh, just uh, healing from our um, you know uh, childhood memories or or bad experience in, in the past or are we improving are we still healing or are mm. we improving or is it the same I think it's important to do both hmm. you know um the thing is you can continue improving yourself even if you don't go back to your childhood to kind of unlearn the things that you learned that affect you badly. But the truth is, even if you had a perfect childhood, which of course nobody has one because human nature is to create problems even if there are none, um, you will still have picked up some bad habits, beliefs that don't serve you. And it really does start with your childhood. Like every therapy session I've ever done almost everything that is something that's not self-serving that I learned is from childhood mm. you know because that's when we're forming our beliefs and everybody you know everybody in the world creates beliefs that don't serve them because we all have something we can improve and we're all scared of different things so I think you can work on your childhood beliefs but also different things that happen every day that affect you you know um, so I think you've got to work on both um, to really be at the best state. Um, 
but just take baby steps. You don't have to jump in, you mm. know, like you can start with now, like start with like, what can I improve about myself today? What is the one thing I want to work on? What's my biggest weakness? And just start there rather than jumping in because it might be too much. Um, but take baby steps and it's going to be a beautiful, amazing journey. Mm. What are the things that shows that we have achieved? We, we As a human, we always look, you know, we are uh, we have um, ambitious and we always look for the better and best. And um, in your in your case, where did you find like, okay, maybe this step was a good step that proves to, to myself that I have, you know, I have stepped or done something which I'm happy with as mm. a person and gave me that, you know, I worked hard, but this one, even if it's a small one or a big mm. one, but it just, it could be love, it could be business, mm. could be anything. It says like, you know what, Mona, you made something, you made the progress mm. emotionally. Hmm. That's a big question. Um, I don't know. I think just always like continuing, like even when you don't want to, I think that is probably the best thing. It's not like one thing, but it's just like pushing yourself to keep going even after you're disappointed so many times. Maybe in love, like romantic relationships, I'd say like um, that was a big one because I feel like most people when they go through so many relationships where they're disappointed they kind of give up on finding love and I feel like for me I've always been like if I'm going to open that door I'm going to give my all I'm not going to have walls up so I think that being able to have an open heart that's willing to give a lot even if you've gone through so much disappointment I think that's something I'm proud of and um, yeah I was inspired by one of my friends who um, she's like one of the most beautiful humans on the planet she went through so many bad relationships and like terrible ones, like hmm. when she was engaged and every time it was like a disaster. And I just would see her like go into another relationship with an open heart, um, not holding on to the past, onto like her ex's mistakes and like just having a fresh clean slate with everyone. And I think she inspired me to do that too. Hmm, that's, that's great. It's very yeah. hard to do that though. It is. It is hard, but what's harder is like living with walls, you know? Yes, living alone. Yeah, or or just living with somebody halfway, you know what I mean? Like mm. having a relationship that you're not being fully um, open and vulnerable with or like not giving your all, you know? So I think that it is hard to open up and trust again, but what's worse is like being in a relationship or just entertaining people where you're not really giving them a full chance, you know what I mean? So mm. I think that is something that I'm proud of. Did you find love? Yeah. Okay, that's amazing. Tell me more about, um, maybe I, I didn't have it as but a question I wanna, I wanna here. I want to change my answer. I didn't okay. find love, <laughs> although I did, but um, I always I always like to reframe my state of mind to like hmm. you build love, you know, because I used to look to find love and it's the truth is it's not found, it's built. So I, I do have a great partner. My husband is amazing, but it's it's a relationship that we built over time and it's not found mm -hmm. and i think that that's something important for especially the younger people watching like don't look to find love it doesn't it's not something you find you don't like stumble across a rock and find the right person it's like you find someone they should be somebody you're compatible with but you build the right relationship that creates love you mm -hmm. know yes of course yeah i mean that's a mature thinking and and uh, more sustainable more something that you can rely and build on and it's also empowering because mm. if you're thinking that you're going to just find the right partner then you're gonna like be like oh i live in dubai where a lot of people say it's hard to find love here it's hard to find love anywhere you know it's like what you need to do is look for somebody you're compatible with you share the same values you, you share the same goals the same vision of life and then you build the right relationship you know and, and i think when you take that ownership of like i'm in the driver's driver's seat i can build the right relationship it's a lot more empowering than thinking you need to find the right one you know mm -hmm. what i mean yes what 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 would be the main uh common thing you need to find with your partner that can you can say that's a good point i can build mm -hmm. on that i think that it's really important to look at your core values um like your top three values that you have as a human um and there's many exercises you can do to do that you know and i did that before with my um with one of the coaches we use at Head of Beauty. She's not my therapist, but she's a coach we use. And she gave me an exercise on core values. So um, I think just understanding what your core values are and making sure you have at least two out of three of the same core values is important. It doesn't mean it has to be, like it doesn't have to be that way, but mm. it's better because you'll have more in common. And then also just 
the same vision of the future? Like, you know, do you both have the same family values, the same spiritual values, the same like vision of where you want to go in 10 years, you know, like mm. you've got to think far beyond now, you know, so that you don't grow apart and you grow together. Yeah. Yeah. Mona, but do you think this is a bit, maybe people would look at it like it's okay. Uh, is it, is it the scientific thing we're looking at, but it's love and emotion. So, but do you think we should calculate each and every step in with, with a professional as I well? I think you should do this work on yourself and also before you start dating somebody like mm. understand these things about them before you start to commit emotionally to where you like love the person and you get too deep because if you if you try to do the work later it's too late mm. you know then you're like blind by like your emotions and it's just like you're probably not going to make the right decision so i think it's important to do but of course you also have to have chemistry so it's like you can't have one and not the other. I think you need both. You need to have that chemistry of like, you really enjoy this person. You have that spark, you know, um, they excite you, but also like it makes sense rationally, mm. you know? So I think that it's not right to just follow your heart and it's not right to only look at data. <laughs> mm, yes, exactly. <laughs> it's like both. Both. And, and it's the same in business, by yes. the way. I feel like you can't just only follow your heart. Like you also have to make sure things make sense. Like there's been so many things I've wanted to do that just don't make sense business-wise. Like they don't make financial sense. I'll never make profit. And it would just be a bad decision. I can't do that. You know, it's like, I've got to follow both, but I also don't want to be one of those people who just makes decisions based on data. Cause then I become like everybody else. And before you know it, I won't stand apart and I won't be successful, you know? So mm. it's kind of like, I think both are very important in both areas of your life, whether it's love or business career. Yeah, that, that's yeah. amazing. Even in business, you want to love what you do, even if it makes you money and successful. But if you don't love it, you might lose the connection with it. Yeah, for sure. And that's amazing. <laughs> and uh, just a question about the partner. You're a successful, rich woman. And do you think the partner should, should cope with that always as, as one of the main points that you want to find your partner? He has to be in the same level of success, same level of richness. No. No, not at all, you know, and I've never felt that way even before, like when I was younger, I never looked for a partner that had equal um, areas in their life. I think that it's a package, right? Like I want somebody who's passionate. I want somebody who is hardworking. I want somebody who's dedicated. But um, for me, it's never mattered whether, th whether that relates to them earning the same money I earn or having the same background I have, you know, um, I've never really cared. I think it's because my mom doesn't care at all. My parents don't care about these things. They raised me not to care about this stuff. And I've always been a very independent woman. So for me, I've never, ever thought I need to rely on a man, like never, you know, from day one, I was like, I'm going to rely on myself. I'm going to work super hard. And if my man, if my husband can support me or cannot, it's not going to make a difference in my life because I'm going to support myself. And I want to build a future where I can also support my family and other people too, you know? So I've never had that as a important factor. What I do care about though, is seeing somebody who's hardworking because that's like mm. one of my core values is achievement. So if I, if I'm seeing, you know, if I, I see somebody who doesn't really dedicate their lives to something, it's just, um, yeah, it's not my core value. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think this is very empowering for, for girls, you know, to look for, um, I mean, not to depend on anybody yeah. and, and to... We don't have to anymore. Mm. You know, in the past, we kind of had to because society was built that way. It was like women would, were paid so much less. We didn't have so many career opportunities. You know, we had to stay home and take care of the children more. You know, like now life is different. There's so many, um, there's so many other ways to survive and also create a, a career of your own and thrive, not just survive, you know? So I think that it's not, um, the situation has changed so much. So I think there's no reason not to be independent, you know? So, you know, even if my husband was a billionaire, I would still be working this hard, you mm. know? Like I just love working. I love achievement. And I want to see myself create and um, build amazing things with my team. Oh, okay <laughs> where are you from if i want to ask you this i know mm, where you're from but yeah. where where do you feel you're from oh mm. another deep question wow <sighs> you know i've never really felt like i belonged anywhere um except now i do feel like i belong to dubai like i feel mm. like this is home 
Um, growing up in the States, I never felt American, of course. You know, my parents are Arab, they're Iraqi. Um, they've never spoken proper English. Like, my parents always had funny accents, you know, and we always stuck out like a sore thumb. So I've never felt American. Um, I don't really feel Iraqi enough either because I've never mm. lived there. So it's like whenever I would say to people I'm Iraqi, they would start speaking in Iraqi mm. and saying things that I don't really relate to, but jokes that I don't understand. So it's hard for me to say I'm just Iraqi. So when people ask me this question, I'm not going to lie, I get super anxious and I'm like, yeah. ah, where am I from? I don't know. Um, my parents are Iraqi. I grew up in the States and I've been in Dubai now for 21 years. Mm. So I feel like, you know, I'm a typical Dubai story. Yes, which is yeah. mixed and... Um, People uh, who don't belong anywhere belong in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> well, why did you say uh, you can't find uh, love in Dubai? No, I'm saying people say that. Mm. I, I don't believe in that. And I've, you know, I, I met my husband here, but, um, and I've been, all my relationships have been here because I moved mm. here when I was 17. So all my adult life have been here. But um, I see people say that all the time. And I think that you can't, you can't use that as an excuse because yeah, love is not found, it's built. And it's not just the person you meet, it's like what you bring out of them too. Mm. And also how willing you are to be vulnerable and share yourself and and also do the exercises, like doing the not fun exercises, like looking at someone's core values, asking them the tough questions, asking them about their goals, where they want to be in five to 10 years, making them feel uncomfortable and awkward, mm. you know, um, filtering out the people who probably just want to waste time. And, and again, if you want to waste time, that's your prerogative, that's fine. Um, but if you're looking for something meaningful, like you're looking for love, you should do the work first before you enter into a relationship and before you fully open your heart, you know? So I think you can find love anywhere, yes. but it's up to you. It's up to you. Yes. Create love. Sorry. I keep saying find love. It's create love. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a nice way to, to put it. It's a different way to, to put it, to create love, yeah. to build love. You know, yeah, to, everything is built. Nothing's mm, found. Even love. Everything. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a quote. That's a quote from Mona Katan. <laughs> Mona, I mean, tell me. Um, let's talk about your perfume a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And uh, your love for perfumes in general. Okay. And you always wanted to create your your brand. So tell yeah. me more about it. To be honest, I've always loved perfume and the sense of smell. Like ever since I was a child. Um, and again, I think it comes from being a very sensitive person. You know, um, the sense of smell is more more touching to me than my sense of sight, like seeing something visually or even hearing something, you know, I'm just very connected to that because it's very emotional. It also brings back beautiful memories. And I feel like when people are very sensitive, they love fragrances because it's like whenever you smell something beautiful, it instantly changes your mood, how you feel. It can make you feel happy. It can make you feel confident. It can make you feel sexy. Like any type of emotion you want, you can get it through, through the sense of smell. Um, so I've always loved it. I, I bought my first perfumes when I was living in America. I got my first job when I was 14. And yeah, my first paycheck, I bought two perfumes. Wow. Yeah. And makeup, but perfumes were my thing. Like perfume was more expensive than makeup, so I couldn't buy as often. But I loved perfume. And, um, and it wasn't until I moved to Dubai that like my love was like a rocket. Mm -hmm. Like it went from like love to like, passion obsessed it's like the one thing that i would search for whenever i'd go around in dubai and the sugs um anywhere like it was just so so inspiring like seeing the way people wear fragrances here in this region in the middle east it's just next level and yeah. i always tell everyone i'm like dubai is a perfume lover's playground like it is where you come to play there's so many different types of perfume there's bahur there's oud there's fragrance oils that you find in the markets like people mixing it for you and it's so rich like the love for fragrances here are so deep it's it's so much about your culture your tradition even your family like i have friends i remember um the hab tours actually mm. um my friend noura and uh, mohammed and amna like the whole family they're so sweet um but they really like deepened my love for perfume i remember going to their house and they would like offer you a tray of fragrances and it was like created by a, a local perfumer for their family so like if you wore those perfumes people would kind of know you were with them it's just it's so much more than you know an afterthought it's part of your identity you know when i was in america it was nice of course i loved fragrances then but people would think of it as an afterthought oh before i leave the house i'm gonna maybe put on some perfume maybe body spray 
But here it was like so intentional, so much passion. I mean, at the weddings, like people mm-hmm. putting the bukhur on, putting it in your hair and your dress, like people smell so good all the time. And it's also part of the generosity of our culture too. Like to smell nice is it's part of being generous and like thinking of people around you. So after moving here, I got so inspired and I always, you know, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was a kid. I love business, I love working, I love creating. Um, and I and I thought, you know, if I could ever create my own brand, the one thing I'd want to create in terms of a product, it would be a, a fragrance brand because that's where my passion in terms of product lies. You know, I have other passions too, but if it's a product, it's fragrance for sure. So as I started my, you know, self-employment journey, <laughs> I tried many things. I've, I've done so many businesses. Um, a lot of them were just me doing it on my own, just self-employed, experimenting here and there. Um, but as my journey continued, I really wanted to start a perfume line. And the first time I actually met investors was actually before we even launched Chitta Beauty, before I launched my beauty salon back in the day. Um, and I met investors, but every time it just never worked out. And I do think it's a blessing in disguise. This was 20, 2010 was like when I mm-hmm. first met some investors. Um, I have samples from like 2011, 2013, like back in the day, 10 years, over 10 years ago now, um, but never worked out. And I think it's a good thing because when I look at my decks I had from back then, like my 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 vision of what I wanted to create mm-hmm. was very amateur and it was very regional, like too regional to where maybe it would not be a global success. Um, but what we created now with Kayali, you know, we launched it. I started working on Kayali in 2017. We launched end of 2018. So it's been, um, this is our fifth year and November will be five years. Um, it's a really global brand and what mm-hmm. it is, it's celebrating our local culture, like, um, Arab culture. Um, so Kayali is mm-hmm. my imagination. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's inspired by this culture and how people use perfume. And I wanted to take that and make it global. I was like, there's no global brand from the region and fragrances. And it's a shame because there is no culture in the world that celebrates fragrance like Middle Eastern people. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah. th- there's a lot of international brand trying to get inspired from, from the region to create the, the, the or to add to, uh, to right. their collection. Yeah. So they use this um, uh, Arabic culture and, and the, the yeah. Daoud and the, that mix and, and using it and giving it back to us. Yeah. So I think <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a great idea to come yeah. from the source to, yeah. to come up with this idea. Yeah. And uh, we're kind of in the middle. I wouldn't say or too Middle Eastern to where people won't be able to connect internationally. And we're not too Western where I lost, I didn't want to lose mm. my roots, you know, like I am an Arab in the end of the day, I'm, you know, and I'm very inspired by Dubai. So I didn't want to lose that. So we've created very interesting fragrances that have a kind of more broad appeal, but there's always a touch of a tribute to the Middle Eastern culture and heritage. Okay, for a person who doesn't know much about perfume, how, how do you make a perfume global in, in terms of smell, in terms of scent? Like mm. what are the things that uh, are added or common or some? Mm. I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want you to give all the secrets, but... Uh, there's, to be honest, there is no secret, mm. you know, and that's why I was going to say there's no equation. There's not like this plus this equals global. And even with our scents, I wouldn't say one is the biggest global hit, although, you know, we do have a bestseller. Um, but there's different ones that are strong in each market. You know what I mean? Like, for example, the one that's the bestseller here in the region is not the bestseller in America. Mm. So it's like, you know, people are different. There's going to be different tastes everywhere. I think what makes us more global is just always having that consideration of different backgrounds. And I think that comes from having a global team. Like my team is extremely diverse. And I do think that's again, like thankful to being in Dubai, you know, because being here, you've got people who are actually from very many different countries and they keep their culture, you know, it's like they've been, they've lived there before and they're bringing that here. So it's like, just naturally we're created with so much diversity, if you know what I mean. Mm. And even myself personally, like, I, again, I don't feel like I fit in a box at all. So I feel like I've always had a global appetite, a global mindset, global taste. Mm. So I think that's probably one reason why it's it's becoming a global success. Um, and also I have a great 
partner, you know, we're partnered with Sephora globally. So um, they're fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're always <laughs> your partner, Sephora. Yeah. Most of the, more, most of the stories, success stories came from Sephora. They're I guess, fantastic. With yeah. you, with Huda Beauty. Yeah. You know, I, I like to find a really great partner, nourish the relationship and um, grow with them. You know what I mean? Of course, you can grow by going to other retailers. It can help. It can help grow you faster. But I don't know if it's going to be as healthy. And um, I just think it's better to grow slower with one partner than grow too fast with many partners. Mm. And I, I just, I prefer this way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mona, how do you work with uh, your sister, with your, um, excuse me if I don't know what's the no, inside, okay. but is it under uh, Huda Beauty as an as a, uh, investment company or a company? Do you mean Kiali? Yes, or, yeah. or or your your thoughts, your ideas, mm. your brands. Mm. Yeah. Uh, do you work um, with your sister all the time for the people who doesn't know? Also yeah. me. So when we first created Huda Beauty, mm. it was um, Huda, myself, my sister Alia. We kind of co-founded the business together. Um, and then later Huda's husband joined, I want to say 2015, I think. Um, And my father's been helping and supporting. So it's a really, it's a family Family business business. in the end of the day. Kayali was created under the same umbrella. So we do have a lot of shared resources. Um, A lot of, a lot of the backend resources are shared. I do have some separate resources too, like, you know, my content team, um, my brand director. So I do have like my own team as well, but it's a lot smaller. Um, but yeah, as we're growing, it's becoming a little bit more separated and, um, I don't really work very close to Huda anymore. You know, before when I was working more on Huda Beauty, I've, we were working together like 24 seven, you know, but, um, as I've focused on Kayali, which has really been from launch, but especially during COVID, that was kind of when I was like, I need to like either focus on growing this brand or not because in the first few years it wasn't successful it Mm. was like it launched and like we didn't even meet expectations it was kind of struggling so i was like i need to either focus on this or not and just Mm -hmm. shut it down so i decided to fully focus on it i was like i'm in a tunnel vision on this brand give it everything and try to make it a success so i think it was a blessing in disguise but because of that I don't work that close to Huda anymore, even my sister Alia and Chris, like I'm kind of just doing my own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of like, it's a, as a business, you, you have a family business together, but in terms of like personal, did, did you always feel like people always compare and the success and the, yeah. the name? I mean, Huda, she's like, um, her name is became like, uh, global and yeah. international mm. and yours too but is there a comparison where you always feel like okay I want to uh, you know uh, yeah. how, do, how do you feel about that I think comparison is always going to be there with siblings like no matter what even if you don't work together like you will be compared I think when you're that close in age because we're only a year and a half mm. apart so I think it's even more common and then when you work together it's even more common so of course there's a lot of comparison all the time and I think that you know until recently also like kind of until COVID when I was starting to do my therapy journey and like trying to get my note get to know myself um I also used to be very codependent to her you know um I was codependent with my whole family but specifically Huda it was mm. like every goal I had career-wise was including her and even some personal goals like it was with her and my sisters like the whole family together and then during my therapy journey, I realized, oh my gosh, I'm very codependent, like mm. very, very codependent um, to very unhealthy, you know, amount. Um, so I decided I don't want to be that way anymore. So I'm working hard on myself to stop being codependent. And that's why when we first launched Kayali, I was forcing Kuda to do it with me. I was like, you've got to do this with me. We're doing it together because I wanted to do everything with her. Mm. Um, and it also is a reason why I think it didn't perform well because she didn't have the time to give to it to make it successful. And I was holding myself back. Like I wouldn't do things unless she could do it too. Like photo shoots, events, mm-hmm. like things like that. Even the development, I was waiting for her to confirm everything with me. So until I decided like, okay, I just have to stop and <laughs> do things on my own, uh, create my own path, be more of an individual. Um, a, I think um, I'm definitely like on a more successful path of my own, 
you know, um, but also I think it's probably better for our relationship because I don't want to be pulled into what she wants to do and vice versa. I think I used to drive her crazy by mm. trying to force her to do everything for me. And the truth is, you know, like everyone, I'm an, I'm an individual, she's an individual and we're going to have our own dreams and you need to support that, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So you realize that you need to love yourself more. I mean, I think everybody needs to love themselves more. Um, I don't think I struggled so much with self-love. Mm -hmm. I've always been a very loving person. Um, but I think just give yourself more individuality. You know, let yourself be an individual. And I think that's one of my that's one of my weaknesses before anyway. And it still kind of is, but I'm a very codependent person. I like to do things in partnership. You know, like I love having a partner in everything. And until recently, I didn't really feel confident to do things on my own. Mm. And I think it's partially because growing up, my parents were always like, you can only go there if Huda goes. Because yeah. we were like, you know, my parents were foreigners living in America, so they didn't feel safe letting me go to a friend's house without her. So it was like, I think for them, it was like they felt safer mm. just kind of putting us together everywhere we go. But I think they didn't realize that's kind of creating this unhealthy codependency. And, um, and yeah, I don't think anybody should be codependent, even with your partner like even with me and Hassan I'm like okay we are individuals like I can't expect him to want to do everything I want and vice versa um so yeah I think really creating an individual mindset of mm. like understanding what you want what's your purpose what's your values what makes you happy like you kind of have to have your own path you know mm. how does uh, Huda think and she's happy for you I'm sure that uh, you're thinking that way yeah I think so I think so, you know, um, of course, there's always moments where I want to go back to being very codependent with her and and probably vice versa. But I think I think she is happy for me and I'm, I'm sure it's it's better for her relationship because before we'd always like as a family, we'd always travel together all the time, personal, professional, like no matter what, we'd only go on trips all together for the most part. And it just, um, yeah, it slows things down, mm. you know. I was having a conversation with a friend earlier today. She's opening a business with a friend. And I said, you know, especially when it's a 50-50 partnership, don't slow each other down. Like, make it very clear from the beginning who has what responsibility. Like, go at a fast pace. Like, don't, don't hold each other mm. back, you know. So I think being very independent, even if you have circumstances that combine you together as a partnership or whatever it may be, like you need to be an individual yeah i mean that's amazing yeah i mean you can depend don't depend on yourself or depend on each other but don't hold yourself yeah self. and the culture we're we're in you know in the middle east mm. and even asian culture like indian culture etc like it's very codependent mm. to a very unhealthy level mm -hmm. like it's really 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 unhealthy like the amount of people the amount of pressure people have here to do what their family wants them to do, be how their family wants them to be, have the same look and feel, like the same vacations, the same neighborhood. Like you're almost like your life is planned from you before you're even born. So unhealthy. Yes, it's true. So unhealthy. It's part of the survival back in the days where you have to be part of the tribes, you know, yeah. and then you have to also, and it's part of the respect of the family. So it goes back yeah. to the grandfather. You have to respect him. That's the yeah. oldest man. And then... But Which it I appreciate. Holds you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm, you know, I do consider myself a somewhat traditional person, but um, at the same time, I think that needs to change because people are individuals, and when you allow someone to create their own path, and you support them, you empower them, you celebrate them, I feel like that's when magic happens. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like when somebody really goes after what their calling is, or even the relationship they want. Like I know so many people who are forced into things they don't want. And then you just see it create so much pain and mm. disasters later on. So I feel like you really have to allow people to be who they want, make the mistakes they need to make, of course, with reason. But you need to let people live their life, you know? Mm. We don't own anyone. Yeah. yeah, especially in marriage. I mean, you don't have to get married to somebody from the same group, same no. tribe. Where's Hassan from? He's originally from Sudan. Yeah. Yeah. And he lives in US? No, he um he grew up in Dubai mm. and Canada as well. And he studied in the UK for a mm. bit too. So he's kind of lived all over, kind of like similar to my background. Yeah. Like never really lived in his home country, lived all over, mostly in Dubai. So kind of has that global mindset mm. as well. Um, which was important to me because I didn't want someone who was like from somewhere who can't really think outside that box, if you know what I mean. Um so I feel like it kind of 
it was more relatable for myself mm. you know tell me how did you guys meet and who approached <laughs> first and who um ha- so how this connection happened okay um so basically i i met hassan's sister sally in university she she was my best friend's best friend so like we were close friends through association um and i always loved sally like loved her so much i love her to today today she's an amazing sister-in-law she's one of the sweetest girls ever um but yeah i knew sally first so i've known sally since 2003 so 20 years now <laughs> um we were good friends um and throughout time like you know i've always like looked up to her respected her i found out she had a brother she has two brothers actually um hassan and ahmed And when I found out about Heston, I was like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. And I had the (laughs) hugest crush on him forever. Like huge crush. And it's funny because our mutual friend, Fatima, I would always tell her like, why is he single? Like what is going on? He's so handsome, so nice, so classy, respectful. Um, And he's totally my type. So I'd always like joke around, but like it just never worked out. Like I remember he Facebook messaged me, I think in 2006 2007 yeah. at the time I was in a relationship kind of like going through things and then it just never really worked out and then it wasn't until during COVID I was actually going through a breakup and I was like you know what? I'm not going to take five years to get over this person because mm. all my old relationships I would take forever to get over it and move on so I was like I'm just going to do the work on myself understand myself process who I am what are the mistakes I've made in the past you know, get to know myself better and also get to know what I'm looking for. So I did a lot of exercises. <laughs> I like homework. I'm a nerd, yeah, if you didn't tell yet. Um, so I did a lot of homework. And part of my homework was like looking at, you know, who are the people I know that I think are bachelors that are single who have my values. And I made a list and Hassan was at the top of the list. It was like, I was like, why has this never happened? I don't understand. He's like totally my type. We have so many similar values, very similar families. Like, almost too similar um and i was like why did it not work and then i told our mutual friend i was like tell him to hit on me because i don't want to make the first (laughs) i'm a lady (laughs) so i told fatima i was like tell hassan to hit on me if he's single and like he just reached out immediately and then we went out for coffee and we got married in less than a year oh wow yeah just crazy how some things just come together and they work when it's meant to be you know i believe in I believe in, you know, Naseeb and like mm. destiny and like, yeah, it just, it happened so easy where all my other relationships were so hard and so painful and like disasters. Uh, that's a, that's a really new way to look at things. Yeah. Uh, Mona. It's just like how you worked on yourself and, uh, and also analyze what yeah. you want in life. And, uh, and what, also what, what you did wrong. Mm. Like I'm going to take full ownership. I've never been um, better in a relationship Mm. than I've been with Hassan. And again, like love is built, it's not found. Like I changed myself in this relationship. Mm. And if I didn't, I don't think we would have stayed together because I had a lot of, you know, weaknesses when it came to relationships. Mm. What was the weaknesses, uh, Mona, mainly? Many. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think number one, um, just not communicating my needs. Mm. Um, And if I was upset, just not communicating it. So I would like, instead of telling people how I feel, I would kind of shut down, distance myself, resent people and kind of like slowly get further and further instead of just saying, I need to address this. Like, Mm. I'm not happy with X, Y, Z. You know, we need to solve it. So I think just expressing myself when I was not happy. um, It wasn't there. No, it wasn't there. Mm. It's still something I struggle with. It's still till today. Like, there's so many things on my notes that I'm like, I need to talk to Heston about this and other people too. Like, it's my biggest area of weakness in life. Like, you know, that's my biggest struggle is like expressing myself when I'm not happy with the situation. And um, yeah, it was something I learned through therapy. I wouldn't have known otherwise. Mm. I didn't know that was my biggest struggle until I started this therapy journey. Mm. So yeah. even if you're not happy, you don't express it. You don't say I'm not happy or I didn't like this one mm. in, in your relationship. Yeah. You keep it building until it explodes. Basically. Yeah. And I don't have a bad temper. So I would just like instead of exploding, I'd like, just leave. disappear i guess leave. i'd be like okay this isn't working out bye <laughs> you know <laughs> where it could have been solved you know mm. it could have been solved or if you stand up for certain things early on you have healthy boundaries early on it puts people in their place early on and then maybe they'll treat you differently mm. you know which is again like you bring certain things out of a person right it's not a, it's not just about 
who that person is. It's like, what do you bring out of them in the relationship? It's like a combination of two people. It's not just, you know, you as, a, you know, like, for example, like if you're in a relationship with one person, it's going to be a very different hikmet with somebody else mm. because it's like what they bring out of you, what they allow for you to do, what they give to you, what they, you know, it's just, it's all a combination, you know? So I think that, um, you know, I had a lot of weaknesses in the mm. past, so I, I had to change myself. I really believe like it starts with you, you know, and that's like one thing all therapists try to get you to see, but it takes time because they don't want to tell you it, that you're the problem, but you are the problem. And I was the problem in all my relationships also, you know, but I think I picked probably not the best, but I also was a big part of the problem. Big part of the problem, not expressing what you don't like and what you like. And is it, <laughs> Sorry, is, it, it. <laughs> is it, is it, was it also the, the wrong choice as well? Or it's um, like I, 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 the, the person I'm, I'm with is good, but I did not know how to address, how to ev evolve this relationship. I think it's, I think it's both. But if I had to pick one as a bigger issue, I would, I would say it was myself. You know, because I think that it's kind of like imagine you're a horseback rider. You know what I mean? Like mm. if a really good horseback rider rides even a average horse, they can make it a stud, right? Mm. Um, they could probably even turn around a horse that's not so great, you know, but it's like cracking the whip, kind of putting your boundaries up, putting your expectations up, you know, speaking up, communicating, you know, it's a lot like, yeah, I would say it's like riding a horse, you know, and if a really terrible horseback rider rides on an average horse, it's going to be not so great, you know, or inexperienced. So it's like, you just have to kind of practice, you know, um, getting the most out of your relationship, you mm. know what I mean? Yeah, so I think I was the bigger problem, but also I probably didn't pick the best either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm smiling because of the horse. I like that. I like that uh, comparison. I like analogies. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you find the right horse. Right yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm better at riding. So exactly. it's both. It's both. I, again, if I think, I think if I started, you know, getting to know Hassan before my therapy journey, I don't think our relationship mm. would. I know our relationship wouldn't have lasted a hundred percent. Like, I have no doubts. Yeah. You know, um, Mona, it's nice. I mean, it's brave of you to talk about this and mm. to say, I am the problem. It's yeah. very hard to find people saying, you know, I have some issues or I have uh, that, that was my problem mm. or, or one of the problems that, yeah. was, that was me. That's really brave of you to say that. Well, I think it's a lot of um, reflecting, awareness, self-discovery, therapy. But also realizing that it's the situation for everyone in their lives. Like we all have so much more power than we think we have, you know, like we can all play the victim. We can all say it's like the world. It's my boss. It's my this. It's my that. It's my relation. It's my partner. It's my parents. Like we can all blame. There's always ways to find hmm. someone to blame. But when you start to blame yourself and take full ownership, full accountability for where you are, you are empowered to change your circumstance. And the truth is almost everyone in the world has power to change their circumstance unless you are like locked up in a, as a slave or something like mm -hmm. that, you know? Okay, there, there are some extreme scenarios which are exempt, but as a human who has, you know, authority, who has the ability to decide on their own decisions in life, even if it's a small amount, mm -hmm you have a choice to change things. So I think everybody should empower themselves more and take more responsibility and think of it as a good thing because when you play the victim, you have no empowerment. You know, and I used to play the victim in relationships, mm. I did. I used to think, oh God, it's my luck. It's, it's you know, I only attract this kind of person. I only, you know, this, that. I used to really play the victim so much to where it demotivated me. And I like didn't want to even meet anybody, you know, mm. and that's why after all my relationships, I would take years to even open up to even seeing anybody, you know, mm -hmm. it take years, sometimes five years, <laughs> like crazy, but it's because I played the victim. So I was scared mm. when you're scared. Of course, you don't want to open up your heart or try anything new. You, you're just too afraid. But when you take ownership of like your own mistakes, you're empowered you're actually excited. That's mm -hmm. why when I met Hassan, I was excited because I was like, wow, I see all my mistakes. I see where I went wrong and I'm going to try my best not to repeat most of them. Of course, you'll repeat some. We're human. It's very hard to break your habits and your, you know, who you are. It's like, it's so hard to break your nature, especially the things you've learned for like 30 plus years. 
but it's possible and it takes a lot of work but you can do it and yeah I think now I just in anything even with Hessen personal family stuff work stuff anything I'm like what role did I play in this situation mm. you know I have to empower myself everybody should yeah, that's that's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Um, is Hassan with you in Dubai playing? Yeah. He is. <laughs> <laughs> he is. You know, initially he wasn't really happy about it. Mm. He was like, "I'm doing this for you, and uh, you owe me for the rest of our lives." All right. I was like, "Okay." <laughs> um, so he wasn't really on board. He was kind of like not into it at all. By the end, I think he felt very comfortable, and he mm. actually made friends with everyone, and like it just became easy, second nature. I think whenever you're filming any kind of content, whether it's a podcast, reality show, whatever it may be, it's always a little bit intimidating. Yes. But, you know, I think it's going to be a fun experience. Again, I don't know how it's going to turn out. You know, none of us do. So it is a bit scary for me because I, I have done a reality show mm. with my family in the past and I got to see everything. We were like part of the creative team. Mm. You know, we aligned on storylines. We were like executive producers. So we had editing rights. So it's a very different experience to like with me i'm gonna watch it the same day the world watches it so i am scared <laughs> i told hassan let's watch it under the cover so we can cry and like cringe <laughs> together whenever there's like a weird awkward moment but you know i i, I really took a long time to make the decision mm. but like my gut told me to do this and i'm really excited about it i hope it turns out good i think it would be amazing um, yeah i mean i love the the first one and i'm sure the second one's gonna be much much uh, you know better and stronger Inshallah. yeah hope so you know i was I, it took forever to make the mm. decision i don't know if you knew but i was supposed to be on season one as well and like last minute i just had too much anxiety i had to pull out mainly because of like just not knowing how it would turn out um, but I think the team did such a great job. You know, the production team is amazing. They're so talented. And I think that, you know, for a reality show, it's a little bit more deep. There's a lot more storytelling around real problems, real issues, which I liked. And um, I remember I was chatting with one of my um, friends. She's a close friend of mine, but I work with her often. She does my feng shui consulting. Her name's Charlie Woo, and she was like, if you're going to be your authentic self, do it. She's like, you know, share yourself with the world, but don't change who you are. She's like, people will connect with you more and it's probably going to make people just see more of you, which is going to be a great thing. So I was like, I'm going to just stay authentic to myself and and see what happens. You know, you regret more of what you don't do than what you do. So let's see. Yeah. How do, how do you feel or how you felt when... Um when you heard about this show in terms of like it's coming from the region here yeah. and um you know it's on netflix mm. as, as um you've worked maybe with some um, international production but i mean were you happy were you encouraging uh, them or they encourage you to i mean i was proud of dubai bling because it's a yeah, local dubai it's such a great job mm. Yeah, Mazen, everybody at different project pr productions um they're incredibly talented and so crazy hardworking mm. perfectionist like the amount of people they had working on each scene I was blown away because I've done shows before I even you know I've been on TV shows as like extras before I've done scenes in certain shows mm. but I've never seen such a detailed production um, who is obsessed with everything like even um, Mazen's wife MJ she was the creative stylist on the show like the amount of effort she put into mm. everything was nuts and i appreciate that I, I really appreciate people who are passionate who go the extra mile and who care mm -hmm. and i think they're so talented and your take on the criticism the first season took what criticism um <laughs> what are you, know, you talking about like uh, millionaires fake uh, stuff like that words oh. you know like uh, you know it's called dubai bling so mm. of course it's you know, it's a name that's going to invite criticism because mm. it's, it's you know, it's a polarizing name. You know, some people don't want Dubai to be too blingy. Some people don't like that. People just associate Dubai with that kind of lifestyle. But I think it grabs attention and I think it was a smart name to use. It's, it's um, you know, it's and interesting. it's part of Dubai. It's part, it's, of, yeah. it's part of Dubai. It's not the only part. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think that's why people have to have an open mind. You know, it's like there's so many people living here. There's so many people interested in Dubai, intrigued into how it is to really live here. And I think that, you know, I think the international community loved mm -hmm. the show. It was the number two 
top performing show for international shows for Netflix, Mm. which is insane. You know, that's the information I received. So I think the show was so well received. Everyone I know internationally, like even when I meet people when I travel, they're like so excited about the show. They loved season one and they're excited for season two. But I think with every reality show, people just need to remember that people are not just watching to only learn. It's not a documentary. Mm. There has to be interesting moments. There has to be a bit of drama. There has to be a bit of tension. You know, it needs to be it needs to be reality. And and life is not easy. It's not a straight path. There's drama, and people want to see that. They don't want to mm. just. It's not a documentary. So I think people who are not happy with the show need to remember it's. It, don't be so serious. People watching reality shows are not that serious. <laughs> like they're using it to switch off, enjoy their lives, and just you know, laugh at the end of the day. Exactly. It's not a documentary. It's not a documentary. just don't take literally everything. Exactly. uh, Although it is reality and some of the reactions and most of them are kind of maybe genuine. This is how I feel. Right. And yeah, how was the feeling with the team in general? Like the the cast? The cast, yes. Yeah, I mean, I had a great time, Mm. you know. Um, I I ended up really getting along with everyone, you know. Um, But that's also me in reality. Like, I don't usually fight with anybody it's very rare for me to ever not get along with somebody so I had a great time getting to know people honestly you know from the very beginning I had only really known Chris Fadewell as Mm. well as Lejane Amran but probably Chris would be my my the person I was the closest to but um I knew of the other cast members I knew of Ibrahim I knew of LJ um bliss as well um but zayna and stuff i met the first time through mm-hmm. the show but we got really close actually i'm seeing her tomorrow oh. or the next day Who, seeing zayna her or sunday Safa? uh zayna mm. i love them i think yeah, they're I all, all like really fun people um perfect for tv mm. all right i was researching and i find that um, there was a rumor that you're gonna do a dating app yeah, yeah. no I don't know. Yes. Maybe. Do you what? believe in dating apps? Like, do you believe in finding the right partner on the internet through apps, for mm-hmm. example? I think that, you know, it's another way to find someone, you know. And again, like, it's there's so much work into finding the right person. I'm not opposed to dating apps, you know. I think you've got to be careful. Um, and I think you've got to think of your profile as like a marketing tool. Like, and be mm-hmm. careful with what you're putting out there. Because I, I did experience, like, getting to know someone through an app um, twice, you know. Um, the first time it was just coffee and never again. I deleted the app for four years. <laughs> it was, <laughs> yeah, I met somebody and I was like, oh, my God, if this is what this is about, I'm never using this ever again. I was very turned off. It was, like, mm. just sleazy. But when and, it was your picture on the, on the dating yeah, app? Yeah, it was my So picture. you were, like, open about yeah. it. Yeah, it oh, was. No. And the second time I did meet somebody through a dating app also, and it was, like, I was meeting... I met lots of people. I Mm. only met one person in person, but it was a very different experience. Like the people I was meeting were very different. And it was because like what I put out there was very different. So Mm. like, I think people need to think a bit deeper about the photos they use. Like think of it as like your billboard, you know, of, of trying to attract somebody that you want to attract. And the second time around, like I, I put out like very natural photos, a lot less makeup, Mm. no editing, (laughs) Like, I didn't fine-tune my photos. I didn't face-tune them. Um, Some of them were nice and pretty. Some of them were just me with my family, like, having fun, being goofy, because I am a goofy, fun person, I think. Um, And then even one of the photos was, like, a deep quote, you know? So it was Mm. like I was putting out a lot more deep things. And I I put it straight up. I was, like, looking for something real, Mm. not looking, you know, looking to have deep, meaningful conversations, stuff like that. I don't remember exactly what I wrote, but it was, like, very deep so naturally you're going to filter out a lot of people who are looking for something just a good time you know Mm -hmm. what i mean so like if you are looking for a real relationship as a woman try to avoid overly glam photos i know it's sad like i'm someone who preaches be glam all the time but on a dating app you want to kind of hold back because you want somebody who wants the real you you know Mm. what i mean like don't be with somebody who's going to just look for a gorgeous girl you know pretty photos etc and i guess for men it's kind of like don't lead with money because like you know the most common thing you see is men going after women for their looks women going after men for money so like if you are um even if you're not rich like rich not rich whatever don't be materialistic with your photos you know remove all of that because if you put 
you know, pictures of you like with a nice car and a nice restaurant, super fancy in the background, you might attract people who are just looking for that. Mm -hmm. If you don't and people are still interested, you know that they're not only looking for that. You know? Yes. So I I approached the dating app world very differently the second time around. And it was a very different experience, you know? Yeah, but the the, what's surprising for me is not surprising, but probably it's just like I can't put my head around it. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who uh, will be the same. Is like the courage that you have to be on a dating app. It's really, it's it's just like... uh, so you okay you put the specs of how to be on a dating app in mm. terms of profile and mm-hmm. what to look for but just the fact that you are on a dating app is it well. needs a, it needs a courage needs an openness and needs like because most of us mm. i'm talking about me but us may meaning maybe the region would be shy to yeah. be on a dating app well i think it's um again kind of like therapy it's taboo but i think it's the future it's not going away it's probably going to become more it's going to become more common as time Mm. goes on like it's going to be more accepted it's going to be the norm it's going to be weird to like meet people in person you know it's going to be weird to like have met your partner by coincidence Mm. you know or through a friend it's like it's becoming the norm and i think that if you approach it in a different way where you're like it's just going to allow me to meet more people meaning you have more people to filter through, meaning Hmm. the probability of finding the right person is higher. Um, I think it's okay, but I think there's a lot of do's and don'ts. Hmm. You know, I think for me, a big do, a big don't is don't meet the person face to face for at least a month. That alone filters out people who are not serious. Because if someone's really interested in getting to know you, they won't mind just talking Hmm. for a few weeks. If someone's like, okay, they they start disappearing after you're like refusing to meet them face to face after a few weeks, they're not really that interested, you know, but if someone's really interested in what you have to offer the person you are putting out there, like don't put anything materialistic, don't put overly gorgeous photos, put things that are very natural, very simple, put a real description of who you are as a person, your core values, put that out there and don't meet them in person for at Mm. least three, four weeks. By default, you have better chances of meeting someone who cares to get to know you. Mm-hmm. Almost everyone I know who are very decent people, they're on dating apps. You know what I mean? Again, mm. it's probably a stigma that needs to be changed. Um, it's a perception that needs to be changed. I mean, I think a lot, you know, a lot of people I know found their partners through dating apps, their husband, mm. their wife. It needs to change. It needs to change. I mean, I like the idea because you said something is true. It's like, okay, we might be dating on, on Instagram and dating mm. on Facebook and it's not a dating app, but we are dating it's digitally. Online, yeah. It's on, on online, but right. it needs to be, yeah. Yeah, it needs to be changed. Mm. Um, but again, like whether it's any of the big apps out there, and you're, you're wanting to join to try and find a partner, I think it's all about how you create your profile and how you filter people out. You know, it's so easy to filter out, filter out the nonsense once you learn a few things. And I think first and foremost, um, this is gonna sound weird, but um, whenever I started dating after therapy, getting to know people after therapy, I would take notes on every person. Oh. Like I have a note. And it would be like the person's name, information, kept records of everything because it helps you find inconsistencies. It helps you find red flags. Mm -hmm. It helps you remember things because as emotional people, we forget. We start to lie to ourselves Mm. about circumstances, especially when it comes to romantic love. We want so badly to be in love. That's how we were designed. Mm -hmm. So what you find is like, as humans, we start to lie to ourselves a lot. So take notes on the person, whether it's meeting them through an app or just in real life or whatever, just like take notes and it will tell you the truth. It'll tell you what you need to look out for. Hassan doesn't even know this actually. Mm -hmm. Like when we first started dating, like after every date I would write, I'd be like, okay, I like that he did this. This is something I think could be a problem in the future this is this, this is that, this is a red flag. Although with Hassan, there weren't really red flags, you know, Um, but I would take notes. Mm -hmm. And um, even on the phone, like, you know, phone calls with guys that were talking to me, trying to, you know, trying to start something. I would take notes after every single phone call 
sometimes during the phone call. <laughs> wow. And I was like, okay, yeah, this so doesn't add up. Yeah. <laughs> that is a red flag. Yeah. No, I think I, I understand why you do it because you don't want to fall into the the story itself, the romantic, uh, the the fantasy. You want to you want to fall in love with the person uh, the way he is without the mm, the, the dream just, about the not story. Not just that, it helps you really filter out the bullshit. Hmm. That's the most important thing because the problem is most of us are lying to ourselves all the time. But especially when it comes to romantic relationships, we really lie. Like the truth is nobody sees life the way it really is. Like we all have our own biases, right? Like our perceptions are so swayed. But when it comes to romantic love, I think we are the most, you know, um, dishonest with the truth, you know? So that's why taking notes, making records, keeping things in black and white, and then you read it later, it's like it really puts you in a reality mm. check. Um, yeah, it's 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 something that I recommend to everyone. Yeah, because when you're reading it, it's, it's just you're white. not you can't deny it. exactly, and it's not in the emotion. It's mm -hmm. not in that feeling. It's not when you when there is something is like giving you the. Um, it's not a pressure but just like you're in front of a person so you're into the yeah. scene itself so you're out you're thinking exactly. drinking coffee yeah <laughs> exactly. focusing and you just can't you can't lie to yourself if mm. the truth is there mm -hmm. you know yeah that's a lesson Mona that's great I'm 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 really happy about the things you said oh. um, it's it's important to for to to be vulnerable and to show it to people because mm -hmm. we are all vulnerable, but yeah. we just hide it. And it's important to say, like, you know, I'm I'm happy, I'm successful, but I'm vulnerable and I want to talk about it. And these are my weaknesses and and these are my how I'm solving it and how yeah. I'm, I'm uh, moving on. Right. I still have so many weaknesses and they will never end. Mm. You know, I think everybody does. And once you solve one, you're going to find out there's another one and it will continue forever. And that's life. You know, I feel all of us until the day we leave this world we will be working on ourselves you know that's great mona thank yeah. you so much habibi i <laughs> really so love talking to you same here i love your energy the, you. the second you enter the 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 office thank you or the studio mm -hmm. i love your energy thank and you same here keep it up thanks thank a you lot. so much thank you for thank having you. me thank You're you welcome. bye